It's my pleasure to introduce Jonathan Court from University of Georgia. In fact, his PhD advisor, Professor David Christ, was supposed to introduce him today, but he was busy at the moment, so he asked me to introduce Jonathan. So actually, John Ray from the Midwest, right? He obtained a bachelor's degree in chemistry and biochemistry from Oberlin College in Ohio in 2016. And then later that year, he came to Wayne State University University and subsequently joined the lab of David Christ Group. And unfortunately for other Wednesday, 2009, 2019, David Cry decided to move to University of Georgia and the eminent scholar chair there. And Johnny decided to move with David uh, to University of Georgia and they've been there for two years. And his PhD work focused on the modification of amino glycoside antibiotics and analysis of transition state for imparted by the glycosidase enzyme and glycosyl transferase through the substrate site trend restriction. The floor is your, your journey. All right, so today I'm gonna to be talking about how glycosidases and glycosyl transferases have evolved to maximize reactivity of their substrates by restricting their side chains and maximizing transition state stabilization. So before we get on to that portion of the talk, I wanna introduce, or I wanna go through the different side chain conformations that sugars can take up. So uh, sugars can take up one of three different staggered side chain conformations. The first is the gauche-gauche or GG conformer, where the side chain is gauche to the ring C505 bond and gauche to the ring C4C5 bond. The second is the GT or gauche trans conformer, where the side chain is gauche to the ring CO and trans to the ring CC. And the third is the TG conformer, which is vice versa. So the ratio of these conformations that's observed in solution is impacted pri uh, primarily by the stereochemistry of C4. When you have an axial OH at C4, as this is in the case for glucose or for deoxy sugars, you see about 50% GG and 50% GT. When you have an axial OH at the four position, this ratio shifts a bit such that the D, uh, you see about 15% GG because that conformation is now destabilized, 55% GT and 30% TG. Now the influence that these, that these conformations have on glycosylation is really quite interesting. In some seminal studies carried out by the Bulls group in 2004, Bulls and coworkers synthesized three conformationally locked donors where each, uh, where each one has the side chain restricted in a different conformation. There they found that under the same glycosylation conditions, the GG compound reacts significantly faster than the GT, which in turn reacts much more quickly than the TG. The reasoning for this is that in the GG conformation, the lone pair of the side chain oxygen can overlap nicely with the oxycarbenium pi star orbital, thereby stabilizing the plus charge that develops over the course of the reaction and thus maximizing reactivity. This is in fact analogous to the axial OH of galactose, uh, rendering that sugar a bit more reactive in glycosylation, or about seven times more reactive. Um, in the GT case, you see um, poor overlap between the lone pair orbital and the oxycarbenium pi star, but you still have some degree of electrostatic stabilization, leading to an intermediate reactivity. Finally, in the TG case, you see that um, <clears throat> the side chain is now pointing away from the positive charge, and you thus generate an unfavorable dipole moment that destabilizes the oxycarbenium ion, and this is analogous to the equatorial O4 of glucose. Now, consequently, enforcement of the TG conformation encourages more SN2-like character in glycosylations. So our lab has done pretty extensive work on the influence of side chain conformation during glycosylation. And here are a couple of examples, just to make this a little bit less abstract. So if we take this naturally occurring sialic acid donor, we find that the side chain uh, is found exclusively in the GG conformation. Our lab synthesized uh, an epimer at the seven position, which takes up the GT conformation in solution. 
When both of these are placed in a competition reaction, we find that only the GG conformer undergoes any glycosylation at negative 78 degrees. In fact, you have to raise the temperature to negative 60 to get any reaction of the GT compound. So clearly, GG is more reactive. Likewise, our lab synthesized some pseudominic acid or a pseudominic acid derived donor, which takes up the TG conformation in solution. And we were able to take advantage of this to generate exclusively equatorial glycosides during glycosylation, something which is normally quite challenging to do. The reason for this is that the glycosylation was rendered pretty much completely SN2-like, indicating that the TG conformation can impart higher selectivity. Now, as I said, we've been doing this work for about maybe 10, 15 years or so. But recently, we began to wonder how much behind the curve are we as chemists? Because this phenomenon was only recently, or comparatively recently, uh, established. So we really had to wonder, do enzymes, or have enzymes that invoke oxocarbenium-like transition states, have they evolved to take advantage of this increased reactivity and do they bind their substrates in the GG conformation? So I'm gonna give a little bit of background on these enzymes before we begin to delve too much into that question. So the two broad classes of enzymes that we look at are the glycosyl transferases, which catalyze glycosylation, and the glycosyl hydrolases, which cleave glycosidic bonds. And so these two enzymes are very important in the general field of medicinal chemistry as they're involved in a wide range of different disease states. As a result, their inhibitors have a lot of therapeutic uses. So I've included two uh, commercial drugs that are currently on the market on the bottom right of the slide. On the left-hand side, we have Miglitol, which is a commercial diabetes medication, which acts as an alpha glucosidase inhibitor. And on the right, we have Zanamivir, a commercial antiviral agent that acts as a neuraminidase inhibitor. To break de uh, these two broad categories of enzymes down a little bit, for the GTs, there are really two main categories. The first are the Lelois GTs, which have a sugar nucleotide as the leaving group, and the non Lelois GTs, which have a phospholipid leaving group. Now, these we aren't really going to touch on that much more because um, we weren't, as we'll see soon, we weren't able to find many uh, crystal structures of these guys because uh, they're found in membranes and are difficult to generally isolate. I also should mention now the phosphorylases, where the leaving group is a simple phosphate or pyrophosphate. And based on the amino acid sequence of these enzymes, they can be classed as either GHs or GTs. Now here, these enzymes do catalyze both sides of the reaction, but strongly favor uh, one in vivo. Then finally, we have the transglycosylases, which are a family of retaining enzymes that based on amino acid sequence are categorized under glycosyl hydrolase families. That being said, they do catalyze the transformation of one glycoside to another. So now that we've gone through the different types of enzymes that we're looking at, we come back to the main question of the talk, which is have these enzymes evolved to bind their substrates in the GG conformation to maximize reactivity? The way that we figured this out was by manual inspection of the protein data bank through assistance uh, with the Carbohydrate Active Enzymes Database, or CASI. And we looked for crystal structures of hydrolases and transferases that have a hexapyranoside in the active site or the minus one site that have a hydroxymethyl containing side chain. And we wanted to see how different the population distribution of the enzyme bound ligands is from those in solution and also to what degree these side chains are restricted through H bonding. So just as a reminder, in the glucose series or anything with an axial O4, we have 50% GG, 50% GT. In the galacto series, we have 55% GT, 30% TG, 15% GG. So have these enzymes evolved to, max to maximize reactivity? The short answer is pretty overwhelmingly yes. For the most part, you see exquisite selectivity for the GG conformation. If we take a look at the alpha glucosidases, for example, you go from about 50-50 GG to GT in solution to 77 structures out of 78 holding the side chain in the GG conformation. 
And that selectivity is pretty close to maintained across a lot of different families of enzymes. Likewise, the degree of H bonding, uh, the number of crystal structures that show H bonding to the side chain is very high. So it's not just that uh, the side chain fortuitously took up the conformation we expected, it's that the side chain is actively restricted to that position. So going into some more concrete examples, if we take a look at isophagamine, for example, this compound on the bottom left, I should note that this type uh, of structure here indicates just a freely rotating side chain. In solution, isophagamine takes up between 37 and 47% GG, but when bound to glycosidases, you see 14 out of 15 structures take up the GG conformation, pretty much all of which are restricted through H bonding. And I've shown a couple of examples here, as in the case of GH1 beta glucosidase and GH113 beta mananase, where despite changes in the ring conformation, you still have the side chain held in the GG conformation. And there was a nice uh, crystallographic snapshot type study carried out by Wang and co-workers where they were able to get crystal structures of a starting material analog, a transition state mimetic, and a hydrolysis product analog, all bound uh, to termite GH1 beta glucosidase. And we can see through analysis of this that the side chain is held in the GG conformation on initial binding, through the reaction, and up until product release all through the same amino acid residue. So clearly there's pre-organization of the side chain that's there to maximize reactivity. Going on with the phosphorylases, we see yet higher selectivity for the GG conformation with only one structure out of about 130 odd exhibiting uh, any other conformation than GG. There it's an eclipsing conformation and so it's not reflected in these three columns, but still very much is counted in our total. So I've shown here three different examples of phosphorylases where again, the side chain is held in the GG conformation. The, or the transglycosidases again, show pretty much the same results. Looking at different crystal structures of uh, B circulans CGTase, we see that a starting material analog, a transition state mimetic and a covalent intermediate all show the side chain being held in the GG conformation despite uh, changes in ring conformation. So now let's go ahead and move on to some of the exceptions. The alpha galactose series, both the hydrolases and the transferases behaved pretty much as we expected where they show very high selectivity for the GT conformation. Now this is completely consistent with what we were talking about before in that the GG conformation for these systems is destabilized due to interaction with the axial O4. So these enzymes have evolved to bind the next most reactive side chain conformation. And in fact, the preference for this is nicely illustrated in this left crystal structure of T. maritima alpha galactosidase. Here, the, uh, we have a cyclohexene derived inhibitor and find that the side chain pretty much eclipses that pi bond. That being said, it still formally takes up an analog of the GT conformation because the side chain bond is still trans to the C4, C5 bond. So if the ring were saturated, the side chain would still be held in the same place and that would be GT. Now, what we, all, what we find is that by eclipsing this side chain with the pi bond, you generate a significant amount of allylic strain, which means that the fact that it will still crystallize this way Means that, the pref means that the preference for the GT conformation is still quite high. Now the beta-galactosidases or another class, or beta-galactose processing enzymes are another class of exceptions that we found kind of surprising, but very interesting in that they predominantly favor the least reactive TG conformation. And this is actually nicely illustrated by looking at crystal structures with specifically UDP galactose. So when bound to alpha transferases, you see exclusively the GT conformation, again, held with H bonding to the enzyme. And on the left, we see that uh, when binding to beta transferases, you see exclusively the TG conformation, again, held through H bonding. While we're not entirely sure of why this is yet, uh, we do, have to wonder whether this is an evolutionary result of trying to temper reactivity. So 
A study of human galactosyl transferases A and B carried out by Lowry and coworkers is actually also quite interesting in the context of this work. Lowry and coworkers found that the natural substrate of uh, these enzymes, UDP galactose, will bind in a stepwise fashion, first anchoring at uh, the first anchoring by the UDP group and then rotating the pyranocide until it reaches what's called the catalytically active tucked under conformation, where the ribose phosphate bond is directly below the plane of the pyranocide. What's interesting about this is that we found crystal structures of these intermediate conformations, and in none of them do you have H bonding to the, uh, to the enzyme until uh, the pyranocide is actively uh, is in the catalytically active conformation. So as a result, that really uh, helps illustrate that this isn't just some fortuitous coincidence and is there for the purpose of maximizing reactivity. Finally, the last couple of classes of enzyme I want to talk about are the alpha manosidases and the beta n acetyl glucosaminyl transferases. Here, at first glance, there seems to be not great selectivity between GG and GT, especially apparent in the alpha manosidases, where it looks like it's about one to one. But in fact, when you break these down into their corresponding families, where they're separated by amino acid sequence, you find that specific families, such as uh, 92, 99, and 125 for the alpha manosidases, favor exclusively the GG conformation whereas other families favor near exclusively the GT conformation. And the same can be said with the N-acetyl glucosaminyl transferases. And again, that's nicely illustrated by looking at uh, crystal structures bound to UDP glycnac, where um, when bound to GT13, you see that the TG conformation is enforced. Here, while you don't have H bonding to the active site, you do have an aspartate that's placed directly above the plane of the ring that sterically disfavors the GG conformation. On the left, we have um, we see that when UDP glycnac is, is uh, bound to family two enzymes, you have four cases of only the GG conformation, where again, you're held through H bonding. So all things said and done, we see that predominantly the GTs and GHs have evolved to bind the most reactive sidechain conformation. So where does that leave us? Well, the next intuitive step is the design of conformationally locked glycosyl, uh, uh, conformationally locked inhibitors to maximize selectivity and or binding affinity. And once again, we see that we're, uh, nature is one step ahead. So uh, down here, we have two naturally occurring glycosidase inhibitors. The left one, castanospermine, is conformationally locked in the GG conformation, and the right one, is 1-deoxynegyramycin, uh, is freely rotating in solution. According to studies carried out by the Davies lab in 2006, castanospermine inhibits, the, inhibits uh, T. maritima GH1 beta-glucosidase about four times as effectively as does deoxynegyramycin. So clearly, conformational locking of the side chain can lead to some very positive impacts. So currently our lab is working on designing improved inhibitors that are conformationally locked. So now I'd like to thank my advisor, Dr. David Kreitsch. I'd like to thank Drs. Rob Woods and Kelly Moorman for their very useful input on our work. I'd like to thank the past and present members of our lab, our various funding sources, and I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to listen to my talk today. <laughs>